The following program contains scenes and language of a frank and explicit nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Live from Los Angeles. Hoorah! Here we go! This is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> we'll do it live. We'll do it live! Okay. It is 7.23 p.m. Do you know where your dedos are? They're right here. Hey, waiting for our asses to show up. Hey, we're here. We just finished recording an episode, a very special episode, uh, with our first guest on a podcast ever. Ooh, even I'm intrigued. Mr. Ben Kissel joined us for the uh, story of Aaron Carter, and that will be out on all platforms tomorrow. Yeah, Aaron Carter was a long time coming, and... Very interesting story. Very sad. Yeah. But there are there was also some fascinating moments. A lot of fascinating moments. And uh, people will get to hear that tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that by tomorrow evening. Okay? Yes. And as far as this evening, boy, do we have a show for you tonight. We do. We do. My God. Where do we start, Kyle? I, I mean, you know. I can tell you exactly where we start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. to Mr. M. Emmett Walsh. You didn't do the transition thing that you love. Oh, hey. Well, hold on. Stand by. We are going to M. Emmett. Walsh. Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> so, were you aware of him? Were you a fan? Um, I knew of him, uh, but, I mean... No, I didn't know him by name, to be honest. I'm a big fan. He's one of those character actors who was in everything. Yeah. I mean, we're talking Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. And he's probably most famous for Blood Simple. Yep. And this is the Coen Brothers' first thriller. This is what set the stage for everything afterwards. Mm. Before Fargo, before No Country for Old Men. Yeah. Blood Simple is where they announced themselves as these stylized filmmakers yes. and gave a really great role to M. Emmett Walsh as a private investigator. And he knocked it out of the park. In fact, why don't we just get right to that clip? All right. He goes head to head with Dan Hedaya. Mm. No pun intended. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Do you see any that you see some of the movies he was in? Uh, yeah, we're saying he was, uh, in Critters, which was a great <laughs> childhood movie for me. It was on the sci-fi channel every day. It seemed like, uh, did you find it scary? Critters? Yeah, we're talking about Critters. No, I thought it was hilarious. Kevin Bacon was also in that. I hate to admit, but I think 
when I was a kid, I saw the commercial for it for Critters, and it scared the hell out of me for some reason. Oh, sorry. Kevin Bacon was in Tremors. Yeah, Tremors. <laughs> uh, but Critters was hilarious. The the little alien things. The Critters. Yeah, that scared me. That scared you? Yeah, because I would go to my basement and I would th- like think I would see them rolling around. <laughs> Critters, for some reason, it's it was up there with like uh, Attack of the Rotten Tomatoes or Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was the commercial that scared me more where it cut off. Like it made the rounded up all the scary parts. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing a clip here. Oh, no, I have the clip. Oh, I'm just getting it. Oh, OK. So, yeah, this is M.M. and Walls from Blood Simple. Coen Brothers. In Greece. In Greece. They would cut off the head of the messenger that brought the bad news. So Dan Hidea is saying that to M. Emmett Walsh because he brought him some photos that he didn't like. Yeah. Well, first off, Julian, I don't know what the story is in Greece, but in this state we got very definite laws about that. Second, I'm not a messenger. I'm a private investigator. Don't come around here anymore. If I need you, I'll know what rock to turn over. <laughs> it's good. You know? <laughs> what rock to turn over? That's very, very good. <laughs> Give me a call whenever you want to cut off my head. I can always crawl around without it. (laughs) How great is that? Fantastic. And if you actually study his acting in that scene, it's pitch perfect. Mm. Because at once he's menacing, a little bit frightening, but then he's funny. Yeah. And he gives it like he lets it breathe when he's reacting to Dan Hidea, where at first he's just like staring at him like, oh, did is he scared now? Did the words sink in? Then he starts hysterically laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's M.M. Walsh in a nutshell. Right. In a lot of movies, he played a this is more of a lead, actually, for him. But he played a lot of side characters with subversive personalities sometimes a bit annoying in a good way yeah. because that's what the character was supposed to be to needle yeah. <laughs> some of the protagonists. <laughs> he was in a great episode of tales from the crypt as a taxidermist oh. who goes a little too out of control with his hobby. Let's uh, just put it that way. Dun, dun, dun. And he might just become one of the <laughs> works of art oh. himself. Thanks to an angry wife. Wow. And then he was in a little scene movie called The Music of Chance with James Spader and Mandy Patinkin. It's actually a poker movie where they become indentured servants (laughs) to these rich guys after they lose in a home game. (laughs) And M. Emmett Walsh is like the groundskeeper who's hired to watch over them with a shotgun. Oh my God. It's a great movie. If you can go find it, the music of chance. Yeah. And he was in my best friend's wedding and tons of other movies. And I have one more clip here from one of his later movies, a Christmas classic. Some might call it. Mm. Do you know what I'm getting at here? Uh Oh, I don't know if I know what you're getting at. Does this help you figure it out? Uh, uh? Oh, yeah. So in this heartwarming scene from Christmas with the Cranks, Tim Allen gives up his luxury vacation to his kindly old neighbor, M. Emmett Walsh, even though they had been feuding for decades. Ah. Uh. Luther, Luther. This means so much. Uh, th- thank you. You're welcome. Hey, hey, uh, does this mean we have to start being nice to each other? 
course not. Good. As I still don't like you that much, old man. Well, that's good. I'm not that fond of you either. Oh. Hey, Beth, we got a pack. <laughs> I'm not crying. Oh, You're crying. They don't like each other very much. <laughs> So M. Emmer Walsh was 88 years old. Wow. He died Tuesday in Vermont. And one of his last high profile roles was as a security guard in Knives Out. Yeah. So he was still working on up until the end. That's crazy. Those character actors don't stop. Yeah. That's how you get over 200 IMDb credits. Yeah. What, what did it say? 233 with one more to come. And none of them on Nickelodeon. Well, that's good. <laughs> Does that signal a story change here? Not quite. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, but not to that one quite yet. All right. Suddenly there was a bigger one oh, that yeah. happened. Jeez. But so, yeah, I, I guess all I can say is R.I.P. M. Emmett Walsh. Yes. You were terrific. Thanks for your work. And on to the next, which is, ooh, this is a crazy one. This is actually breaking news still because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, whoever the hell he is, uh, his properties were raided this week. Um, his kids were taken out of the house in handcuffs. His I, kids were? Oh, yeah. They were all detained and forced to sit on the lawn. And that's nice when your dad gets into trouble for sex trafficking and then you have to be dragged out of the the mansion in handcuffs while helicopters rise above you and film everything. Awful. Um, yeah. That's brutal. I thought I had a rough day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this from the PressDemocrat.com. Uh, Sean Diddy Combs lawyer says raids of the rappers homes were excessive use of military force because the, it's the Department of Homeland Security that raided the houses, which I didn't know they had that uh, use use of force, I guess. Um, it was very militaristic looking. They had, you know, like SWAT teams going and just kicking down doors and dragging people out. But that's what they do when they're dealing with predators with child porn. Yeah. That's what they did for Jared Fogle in 2015. Yeah. Well, this is a federal case, but it's a se sex trafficking investigation. It's not child porn yet. I feel like they're going to find some. Uh, you know, that might be Sean Diddy Combs thing that uh, he doesn't record it. So there's no trail. Ah. Um, but yes, sex trafficking that we don't know exactly, um, you know, the details of what's going on. It could be. Uh, just the use of models for sexual pleasure of himself and different executives and stuff. Models? Well, yeah. I mean, that's what they're saying that this is very similar to Jeffrey Epstein's case. So wait, by models, you mean he would have live models? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what the sex trafficking is yeah. all about because it's in person live, you know. But that often is, you know, it goes by, side by side with sharing videos and whatnot yeah and other materials yeah it is um pretty crazy we're gonna have more details coming out but uh his people said in its first public statement from the music moguls team since monday's raids of his homes by homeland security investigations agents uh yesterday there was a gross overuse of military level force as search warrants were executed at mr combs residences the uh, the statement said from attorney Aaron Dyer, there is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And <laughs> this actually came out before uh, Diddy was trying to get on a plane and his right hand man that was with him got arrested for drug trafficking. <laughs> Let me pull what? that up. Yeah. And this just happened a few hours ago. Oh, my God. Yeah, this is one of those stories that has been cooking for a while. And it's crazy to see it finally come to fruition. Yeah. As something real and concrete. Like, he may have to actually pay for 
some of his transgressions. Yeah, transgressions. That's one way to put it. Uh, the New York Post says Sean Diddy Combs, alleged drug mule arrested as feds intercept rap mogul's private jet in Miami. So he was trying to take off. <laughs> wow. Christopher Valdez says, he, hey, he wasn't called bad boy for nothing, which is true. Um, yeah, he was in Miami and it's crazy because they didn't actually arrest Diddy right now. They, federal investigators haven't even talked to him yet. Mm. And so the, this kid, he was 25 years old and his alleged drug mule was arrested at a Miami airport after federal agents raided the singer's Florida and California homes. Brendan Paul, 25, was arrested Monday at Opa Laka Airport. Okay. Opa Laka. Uh, after the feds intercepted a private plane, he was about to board with Diddy. He was booked on one count of possession and of suspected cocaine and suspected marijuana edibles, according to a police report obtained by the Post. Wow. Uh, Diddy was spotted at the same airport at 3 p.m. on Monday, talking in his phone, talking on his phone and pacing. Pictures showed he has not been arrested or questioned by federal authorities. Mm. The drugs were found inside Paul's travel bags. Uh, he was arrested after tests confirmed they were narcotics, and the airport said that he had been bailed out of jail. And these are all the pictures of his kids and employees getting arrested, or if not arrested, being detained at the home in California, I believe. Wow. Yeah. And here's the mugshot of the kid. He doesn't look too happy. No, I guess he wouldn't be. I mean, I don't know what's up with his eyebrow, the cuts in his eyebrow. Not a big fan of that. Not a good look. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, the federal officers who found the drugs in Paul's bag were working in conjunction with Homeland Security, who raided Diddy's homes on Monday, and Border Patrol. So the Border Patrol is getting involved here. So where is this all leading? This has to be monumental. Like, they must have something concrete on him. Yeah, well, it's it's crazy because for years in 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 the entertainment industry, there's always been whispers of Diddy being uh, a sexual predator and using his power to humiliate people uh, sexually, and that he was, for lack of a better word, diddling little boys. Yeah, I mean that's one thing. There, there's a a la Brian Singer. Yeah. Um, or that he would have to give him the benefit of the doubt and or hot tub parties with young men. Yeah. There was people who came out and said that they uh, walked into a room and saw Diddy getting a blowjob from like his artists. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Not good. Um, there's one one interview here. I'll have to find it um, where. Justin Bieber talks about how he didn't want to hang out with him anymore. Really? Yeah. Like a recent interview? Uh, no, it's from when he was like 17. What? Yeah. So there's there's been clues out there. Yeah, because he was a mentor to Justin Bieber. Yeah. And Usher before him. And Usher was a mentor to Bieber. Yeah. And there's rumors that Diddy did Usher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these aren't even part of the actual allegations that are out there. There's a lot. There's three Jane Doe's that, that are accusing him of sexual assault. And there's a producer of his love album, Rodney, Lil Rod Jones. Yeah. It's piling up. Yeah. Let's see one of these old. Eight hours. Right now, he's having 48 hours with Diddy, him and his boy, um, they're having the times of their lives, like, 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 you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15 year old's dream. Um, you know, I, I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he yeah. signed the Usher. We signed the Usher. I, I, oh. I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, He's with me, so um, and yeah, and, um, and, 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 and we're gonna go full, 
buck full crazy. Going crazy. Justin, he's in. Yeah. I'm speechless. <laughs> yeah. Dude. So was Bieber, it looks like. Yeah, not good. What a horror show to hear Diddy saying, I'm going to be your legal guardian for the next 48 hours. Mm hmm. Unreal. Yeah, there's, uh, let's see. There's other clips out here. He was always a publicity whore, too, Sean Combs. Remember when he went to the award show? I think it was the Grammys with Jennifer Lopez. Mm. That's where she wore that famous green dress. That oh, that's right. Yeah. Trey Parker wore to the Oscars <laughs> yeah. to parody it. Yeah. To New York City. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea. In the 90s, do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orgy like nonstop, right? No, nah, not really. Come I mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you yeah, seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, and it was, <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. Was, so nobody tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't and, say that. Okay. What I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh -huh. Does he have you doing any chores? Are you doing dishes at all? I mean, to keep you humble somewhat? Or are you just like, can you stay up till four in the morning with them and party? I mean, I could. I yeah. actually stayed up longer than them. <laughs> for a dad now would you ever send your kid to puffy camp <laughs> oh no oh no wow wow yeah so he did the same thing to bieber that he did to usher take him in i'm not saying what he did exactly but he definitely took them under his wing yeah lived with them for a time yeah here's another clip before oh no different huh you ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out. Oh, now act different, huh? You ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't, I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you, you never really got my number, so. Right, okay. My number? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Type... I definitely feel protective of her. Um, it was hard for me being that young and being in the industry and not knowing where to turn and everyone, you know, telling me they love me and, you know, just turn their back on me in a second. Um, I don't want her to, to, to lose it. I don't want her to, you know, go through anything I went through. I don't wish that upon anybody. So, um, yeah, if she ever needs me, I'm, I'm just a call away. That music. Yeah, Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Everyone, introduce yourself. My name's Ava. I'm a Scorpio. No, no, no. What's your last name? Oh, Ava Combs. What's your other last name? Ava Baroni. Ava Baroni Combs. Yes, it's it was breaking news. Diddy adopted a white child. <laughs> I want you. I want you to tell them the story about how I adopted you. We, but you still have beautiful parents that. But you're my child also, please, please tell the story. So, <laughs> I was on the streets, <laughs> and then Papa Combs decided that he would like to be a caring man. So then he saw me and decided to pick me up and said to come inside and play with his kids. Yeah. <laughs> what? God. Saw me outside, picked me up so I could play with his kids. Yeah. Boy. Yeah, so there is much more to come with this. I am positive about that. This is Labyrinthian going through all these allegations and rumors and events. Yeah, because there's so many. Someone in our comments said that there's murder allegations, too, which there are. Yeah, Gabriel. Um. Well, first off, the most famous being Tupac. Tupac and Biggie. Yeah. The, wait a minute. That he may have had a hand in both of them. And, I know and there's another one where there was a shooting at a, a party and him and his friends took off after the shooting. Yeah, there's a guy named oh, Dave. Huh? You, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't. <laughs> okay, thank you for sharing. We'll get away from that. <laughs> 
Jake Robles in 1995. Hmm. There was a, it was a shooting, a security guard, one of Suge Knight's friends. He was killed outside in Atlanta a nightclub after an argument with the bad boy camp. Hmm. Yeah, and then there was, he attacked a guy named Steve Stout in 1998. And then there was a New York club shooting he was involved with in 1999. I definitely remember when I was younger. But this is, see, that's what he wants. This is the what he would call the good press. Hmm. If you think he's a bad boy and involved in all these shootings. He had that Suge Knight mentality. Yeah. Yeah, they hated each other for a reason because they were the same goddamn people. Yeah, there was a, the 1999 one. There was an argument at a nightclub. And Diddy knocked a drink out of this guy's hands. And, you know, it sound familiar like Aaron Hernandez. Yeah, exactly. And then it led to this big fight where guns were drawn and this guy was shot three times. Three people ended up being shot and Combs was arrested with two nine millimeter guns in his car. So anyway, yeah, he this goes back a long time. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. This is from NBC News. Feds raid home of Sean Diddy Combs. Okay. Actually, get this shared. And we mentioned the Jane Doe's and his, that producer. And then he was going to do a family reality show on Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hulu severed all ties. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> look. Um. Yeah, let's see this. He's what we call a liability in the business. Big time now. We're starting with that dramatic situation happening as we speak in both L.A. and Miami Beach at the homes of Sean Diddy Combs. You know him as Diddy, formerly Puff Daddy, big time rapper, big time producer, big time superstar. And now the feds at his houses in both locations. This is a live look right now. On the left, that's West Coast. That's L.A. On the right, that's Miami Beach you're looking at. I want to show you in just the last couple of minutes in L.A., agents holding what look to be guns as they walk into the home, as they enter the home. And you can see some of the apparatus there that they've brought. I want to get to Dan and Griffin, who is following this for us now. Why is this happening? What do we know? Hallie, still, as you mentioned, this is a developing story. So we're learning new details minute by minute. NBC News has confirmed that this is a raid being conducted by Homeland Security and that the warrant specifically came out of the Southern District of New York. Now, we believe this is tied to sex trafficking allegations. There's an investigation into claims that he may have been, that the rapper may have been involved in this. So we believe this is connected to that. But obviously, what a split screen moment here to see investigations not only, not only in Miami, but also Los Angeles which shows that this was very coordinated and planned. And remember, when it comes to warrants, these aren't things that are just, you know, done haphazardly. This had to be signed by a judge. So this was obviously very methodical. And this is a sprawling home here in California. This is located in the Holmby Hills area, a very wealthy area, that home that we can see from that. What? I was trying to point to the guilty as hell. Comment, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not Scott very... Cam is is massive sprawling and we don't know exactly what they are looking for it could be something as small as a usb drive or it could be several boxes of documents that could prove or prove his guilt or prove his innocence oh the old sex trafficking documents that could prove <laughs> his guilt or prove his innocence yeah, yeah right so <laughs> did he those guns that we did he prove an innocent of all charges? <laughs> Every allegation, not true. The documents revealed. We saw law enforcement carrying. It sounds like that's pretty routine because they're going into a home. It's a huge home. It's not secured. But from what we have seen on the ground and from local reports that this was a very um, easy entry, there was no sort of violence or any sort of skirmish inside the home. So the weapons that you may have seen there are probably just cautionary. Um, again, this could take several hours considering that these are two separate homes in two different locations. Uh, so we're waiting to get more details and we're still trying to figure out where exactly P. Diddy is located. No one has been able to confirm that at this hour. Alex so that was going to be my other. So how do they, they knew where he, they knew he was at the Miami airport. Mm -hmm. There were people taking pictures of him. So they knew exactly where he was. It's odd to me that all this is happening and they're, not arresting him yet are they giving him enough you know to hang himself i don't know well this is how it goes to mention the gerald 
uh, Jared Fogle situation again, the subway guy, he wasn't arrested right away either. So there was a point where the news was reporting this and they were like, possible connection to this uh, pedophile yeah. predator guy. And so they weren't saying that Jared was guilty yet. Wow. So that comes later. I think they just want to diddy out of the way mm. and then they make their move. He must be shitting bricks right now. Yeah. Freaking out. Someone wanted to play uh, Diddy Usher and Kevin Hart fighting over cereal. Yeah, we uh, we want to thank you. Come here. Don't, don't sit on the bed at night. No homo. No, just, just don't get close to the bed. Don't get close to the bed. But it's just like, yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man. Man, you, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it. You did. No, no, no. I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, did you hear him say no homo? Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Who you kidding? We uh, we um uh, we want to thank you. Come here. Don't don't sit on the bed at night. No homo. No, just just don't get close to the bed. Don't get close to the bed. But it's just like yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man. Man, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it. You did. No, no, I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not getting in the bed. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just gonna, if we can, just let's let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not. I don't want my shot to even like. I don't want it to come close to the bed at all. I, I, I should look like he's fresh off the goddamn plane. Yeah, I should. I should. I should. Fresh off the guard stage. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the frosted flakes, you know what I'm saying, before pause was invented. You know what I'm saying? But it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the all for the frosted flakes because he used to always get up early. And now he's one of the richest stars <laughs> yo, in the world. And I'm yo, like, what, what the, the fuck, fuck did Puff just say? say? Nobody's going to acknowledge this for me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the frosted flakes and we're streaming live. That was stupid. Listen, that was fucking stupid. Listen, having a good time. Yo, are you usher made in the. Hey, yo. Jesus. It was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, on the Breakfast Club, uh, 50 Cent said he was gay because he t said, I want to go take you shopping. And 50 Cent was like, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> it's like, I'm not having another man take me fucking shopping. But that that was his only evidence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the shit Diddy would do is, uh, you know, go shopping for you. So you felt indebted to him in some way. Ah, yeah. so he was trying to possibly groom an older 50 cent too yeah because he wouldn't have been a kid then right no but he still has power right exactly for him yeah yeah wow what a interesting guy <laughs> yeah it was probably before he sold the vitamin water for like a billion dollars so oh oh have all that money right i forgot cent. about that that's crazy yeah um let's see more of this raid footage here okay Another question, Dana, is where is he now? I mean, we don't know is the short answer, huh? He could be anywhere, assuming that he's not here in Los Angeles, because we saw from that chopper video several people that were taken out of the home. Some appear to be in handcuffs, and that is customary when you're doing a raid. They want to check everyone out, make sure everyone who is who they say they are. We have not seen any images of P. Diddy, which shows that he may not be in his Miami or his Los Angeles home. But I'm sure over the next several minutes and hours, we will get more details. Allie. Dana, in just the last maybe two minutes as you were speaking, I want to say even 60 seconds. And again, this is breaking news. I'm going to give you a beat to look at your phone because we are getting in now a, a statement attributable to Homeland Security Investigations, HSI in New York. And in this statement, and I'm, I'm putting it up on screen because this is the first bit of sort of on the record information here, that HSI New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. We will provide further information as it becomes available. And that's key, Dana, as you know, because as we've been talking about, information is not something we have a lot of at this moment. Do we know if there's any news conference set, any kind of opportunity that we might get for our teams on the ground there to question some of these investigators, or is that still TBD? Um, that's still TBD. We've got a lot okay. of our teams uh, working to try to get that information. But as you can see, they put out a statement, but there was lo not a lot of details yeah, issued right. in that statement. So that tells us a lot of information of what they are keeping kind of closed lipped at this point. So, you know, again, we have no idea what they're bringing out. We may get a, a hint as we start seeing bags or boxes brought out as far as how much stuff could 
you know, could, they could be looking for. But when it comes to these sort of raids, they have to look for something very specific. They don't just go into a home and just take out any and everything that looks interesting. So there's obviously something specific that they are looking for in both of these homes. And we may find out what that is or we possibly could not. So obviously we'll be following this very closely. Okay, Hallie? Dana, I'm going to let you back to the uh, the reporting that I know you and the teams out west are doing. Thank you so much. We'll be following Thank this you. obviously over the course of the next couple of hours here. Thank yeah, <clears throat> not good. No. Yeah, and Homeland Security says that it's an ongoing investigation, and remember, it's in Los Angeles and Miami, mm -hmm. and that they will provide further information as it becomes available. They're probably waiting to see if he tries to take off for like some island where <laughs> that's what they were saying. He was trying to go to um, some I, I forget what island they said. Epstein Island. Yeah. Is uh, that still a thing? They didn't. That didn't save Jeffrey. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> uh, they're saying he tried to go to Antigua. Mm. Um, but they. Oh, his private jet did touch down on a Caribbean island. So I don't know. Maybe he did take off, but they're saying that he's trying to go to a place that doesn't have an extradition treaty with America so that he can just live out his life as mm. a suspect in, a, of, in an investigation instead of an uh, actual prisoner here in America. Like Russell Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, Tiflis is saying he definitely got a heads up. They were coming. And that is like the worst part. You leave your kids behind to deal with that shit. What a scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> and his music sucks. <laughs> yeah. Because he just stole from the police. Mm. And I'm not talking about the law, the law enforcement officials. You're talking about Sting? Yeah. yeah. That one song, I'll Be Missing You. Yeah. Wasn't even his. He stole from Jimmy Page. He did. We all had the Godzilla soundtrack. We sure did. Come with me. Da -na -na. Da -na -na. Yeah, da -na -na. that's cashmere. They stole cashmere, you son of a bitch. Just saying. Yeah, no, I mean, great point, great point. Um, <laughs> so well, much, you sound nervous yourself. Much more did, to did come. Did he get to you? Did he? <laughs> hey. Not to me yet. That's why I'm not famous. <laughs> and when did it go from P. Diddy to Diddy? Oh, I mean, a you while. went from Puff Daddy. Went from Sean Combs to Puff Daddy to Puff to Diddy to to I don't know P Diddy Diddy whatever you whatever as you want. David Letterman once said after nine eleven briefly P Doodle Dandy. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy says he can pull a Roman Polanski and move to France. I mean. Yeah, he could start making artistic French films. <laughs> oh, God. Artistic. Um, yeah, there are pictures of his house that are just completely trashed. Um, That's got to be wild to be on that team from Homeland Security, just going through Diddy's stuff. Yeah. That is, that's quite the scavenger hunt. Like, hey, did you find the hard drive? Oh, no, I found the pictures. Yeah, they have these photos. And it's like they tore up his kids' closets and stuff. Jeez. Like like they would have any information on sex trafficking. No, but you never know with these perverts. Yeah. Sometimes they stuff things in weird places. That's the be the worst part about perverts. <laughs> uh yeah, they, they attacked from air, land, and sea. They had a boat pull up Oof. and uh, run onto his dock right there. You got the, the federal agents coming in on the boats. Wouldn't that be awful if he was tipped off and didn't tell his kids? I think that's a strong possibility. But why wouldn't he give them a heads up to at least get out of there so they didn't have to be humiliated? Because <laughs> he's a narcissist. God. Yeah, here are the photos of the inside. You got an open safe here, a mini fridge, a dirty mini fridge with some stuff all over the top of it. Oh, those are incense. And then who puts incense on a mini fridge with like sauces and there's like a Ugh. 
some honey here. There's uh, some spices. It looks like a, maybe a peanut butter jar. Oh, God. And we know <laughs> what that was probably used for. Oh, boy. Sex crimes. Oh, this is a whole circuit. Look at this. Oh, people aren't looking. I wasn't even able to show. It. Okay, so back to this. Here we go. Well, I you could see it little. This is the peanut butter. <laughs> I was using my imagination. <laughs> Spices, some honey. Oh, that's even worse than I thought. Yeah, it's like all dirty on top of the fridge. It looks like a psycho. Yeah. Would would have that set up. And then look at this. This is like the control room. This is where all the Oh boy. All the child sex trafficking uh contracts were written up in here. Wow. And look at that on the right there. It almost looks like a human face. Do you see the eyeballs? Where? Like, look on the right side. It looks like there's eye. Well, I guess there's three eyeballs <laughs> and the face and then the mouth there at the bottom. Sure. It's Epstein. Yeah. Smiling down on his young prodigy here. Oof. Uh, yeah, this is his kid's room. That's just completely ransacked. It doesn't even look like a kid's room. What's with that color scheme? <laughs> How depressing. Yeah. A lot of giant teddy bears in these rooms. Also not uh, not uncommon in predators' houses. Yeah. Although he actually has kids. Yeah. I don't want But to they're all old enough to not have giant teddy bears. Yeah, they're all like adults, yeah. right? They're yeah. Like 55. So then what are they doing with teddy bears still? <laughs> I don't know. Those don't look like those kind of nostalgic teddy bears that they got from grandma. Yeah. Those look like big teddy bears that are holding cameras. Right. Possibly. Rudy with a good point. There's a usually there's a photographer or videographer who knows where all the bodies are buried. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the photographer and videographer that makes a lot of that content. So you got to trust them. Yeah. We got more here. Brian Singer wasn't always holding the camera. Another teddy bear. Looks like we got some candy and Zantac. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Who I thought that? you were going to say Xanax. Nope. <laughs> Probably that. Here, too. little kid. Yeah. You hey, want... Bieber, I, I made you a dessert. Oof. Dessert of pills. Poor Bieber. I know. Yeah, he said he didn't want his daughter to ever have to go through anything he went through. And, and he was spending a lot of that time with Diddy. Oh, here he is. How nice. Just strolling along. Yeah, while well, his kids are his, getting dragged out of the house. In his mom jeans. Yeah. Don't th go up. Where? The, his outfit. Like, oh, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> He's dressed like a lesbian. He is. <laughs> Yep, so he gets to walk free while while uh his kids are handcuffed. Yeah. God, I hope they arrest this guy. I think they will. There's no way federal agents are getting involved in raiding places unless they have a pretty good idea that something really bad went down. You can run but you can't hide. He is too famous. Yeah. Way too famous. So it's going to be a shock. I think he's going the way of R. Kelly. Oof. So he better get his interview out of the way. Yeah. Gail <laughs> King better get on that. Yeah, they're lying on me. Put, on, put in the request now. Yeah. <laughs> Book that man for some entertaining interviews before he goes to prison. My God. And he was conspicuously absent from the halftime show. Mm -hmm. You think Usher would have brought his mentor on? Exactly. That's a great point. Yeah. And Bieber was absent, too. Mm. He said traffic was bad, so he couldn't get. To oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck in traffic. Um, yeah, so we'll see. There's going to be a lot more to come out of this story, and it's going to be insane to see what actually went down and what he's accused of and what he's convicted on, because I think it's coming. And what they find on those uh, hard drives. Yeah. Lots of Diddy porn. Hey. And with that, I'm laughing at my own jokes. Here. Yeah, <laughs> well, you got to have no one else. Well, right? that's true. All right. Let's go to the next story. OK, the next story we have is not exactly a palate cleanser. No, but it is this week's. <laughs> of the week. It is. Yeah. Dan Schneider. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We get to laugh at him. <laughs> Usually the ha ha is much later, so I was taken off guard. Don't worry about it. We're just we we're making sure to get one. Done. No, I like it. Yeah. Uh, this story. I don't know if you guys have seen Quiet on Set. Who hasn't seen it at this point? Well, if you haven't seen it, um, pause now and get on it and come back later because we're <laughs> going to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, Manu says your sins will always come home to roost. Yep. Um, That's very true. Yeah. All right. So where do we start with this quiet on the set? We both watched it. We binged it. Yeah. In one sitting last week. Right. And it was very disturbing. Very well made, I have to say. <laughs> very tastefully done. No, it was a good documentary. It was. It was. What do you want me to say? Uh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> uh, he has since come out and... Dan Schneider. Yes. He creator is... of a lot of Nickelodeon shows. All that. The Amanda Show. Zoe 101. Uh, a Henry bunch of... Danger. Drake and Josh. Yeah. And there was a lot of Dan Schneider talk in this series saying that he was very inappropriate on the set, treated writers horribly. Yeah, made female writers split salaries. So, uh, and that's crazy because that is a Writers Guild rule that you can um, hire a writing team together. Yeah. But this, all that, and like all these shows were famously non union. So mm. he's citing a union rule in order to get people to agree to take half the salary. And so two female writers would get what one man would get on the show, which is crazy. Yeah, the writers are Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan. Mm -hmm. Those are the two that were forced to share the salary. And they also detailed all the sexism they faced working for him during the first season of the Amanda show starring Amanda Bynes, who is not doing well right no. now. Yeah. She hasn't been doing well for a while. Yep. And you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, the pay one of the writers, I believe it was Christy. She was forced to enact getting anal, like a uh, sodomy. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Having anal sex with Dan Schneider while telling a story. That was one of the fun exercises they did in Dan Schneider's writer's room. Yeah. And she still cringes to this day thinking about it. Cringe is a polite word. Yeah. Jenny said it was the worst thing she's ever seen happen to a female in entertainment. Mm. Just yeah. because the Dan Schneider totally belittled them. And in Jenny's last season working for him they had already gotten rid of christy and he calls jenny into the office and is just like didn't you used to work for a phone sex line yeah and she's like no i i never said that dan yeah, yeah you did remember you you talked about working for a phone sex line couldn't we do something with that oh, she's like what are you talking about and it was just dan's way of making her feel like trash yeah Apparently, uh, Dan did so many things. He he would touch girls on the set uncomfortably, like massage them, mm -hmm. request massages from the little kid actors and actresses. See, that is it. That, it sounds criminal to me. Yeah. To make the little kids. They said Amanda Bynes would give them massages. Yeah. Yeah. They were showing a lot of footage of them, like cuddling up together and <sighs> stuff. And in the hot tub. Yeah. In the hot tub, too. Yeah, um, granted, that was part of the show but still yeah. Dan is fully clothed sitting in a hot tub with Amanda Bynes they would do that with other adults as well as like an interview gimmick yeah but something about the sight of this minor in a bathing suit in a hot tub with Dan Schneider who's fully clothed it just feels like icky yeah and as the seasons went on uh Dan Schneider and his, some of his cohorts uh wanted to up the stakes and they weren't able to hide really who they were anymore. Like mm -hmm. on all that, there was a lot of sexual innuendo mm -hmm. and adult humor that shouldn't have been there. And they were thinking that they were getting one over on people to be like, can you believe what we just got on TV? Mm -hmm. And Dan came out, there was this one guy pickle boy. Yeah. And they're like, he likes to tease the pickles and all this weird shit. It was this guy who walked around with a plate of pickles and put one through a glory hole 
and Ray Romano's on the other side being like, oh, pickle, and then eats it and has the juices rolling down his chin. And it was just so weird that anybody would sign on for that, especially Ray Romano. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I have that clip. Oh, shit. And then further backstory is Brian Peck plays Pickle Boy. And so he was a dialogue coach and actor and producer who befriended everybody in the industry, it seemed. Yeah. Everybody loved him, apparently. Yeah. He used to be the dialogue coach on Growing Pains. And in the 80s, he appeared in Return of the Living Dead as an actor. So he sort of had a cult following on top of it. Right. Then he started ingratiating himself to Dan Schneider and the Nickelodeon team. Mm -hmm. And he became Pickle Boy on all that while also being the dialogue coach for young actors, including Drake Bell. Yes. Who was on the Amanda show before Drake and Josh. That was actually a spinoff. Yeah. And so anyway, that's the backstory. But let's look at Pickle Boy, this yeah. clip, and it's crazy. Oh, anyone? I hate it in here. I've never been this hungry. I got to get something to eat. Hello? Anyone? A pickle. Thank you. Oh, I don't know who you are, but this pickle is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> oh. Oh. That's good pickle. Here. Oh. You don't really appreciate pickles until you're stuck in a bathroom. Oh. Kyle, you're not laughing. Putting a pickle through a glory hole in a bathroom. And this is the crazy, scary, brilliant stuff that Dan Schneider was coming up with in the writer's room. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. There's this is the stuff that they were writing? And there's a ton of foot fetish stuff. A ton. So much so that uh, Dan Schneider got the logo of Nickelodeon changed to a foot in the 90s. Yeah. And early 2000s. It's so fucking creepy. They say that iCarly, another show that Dan Schneider created with Miranda Cosgrove in the lead role, that 40 something like 45 out of 97 episodes or something like that 45 of them featured some sort of foot gag yeah either characters getting their foot massaged or someone just like showing their bare foot to the camera yeah and adults 40, like touching them too adults touching them yeah 45 episodes oh my God. half the show but if you count the opening, which includes a very prominent shot of the girls showing their bare feet to the camera, then it's pretty much every episode. Yeah, 100%. And that's just iCarly. Ugh. And speaking of that, I have another clip. This is going to blow your mind. I unearthed this clip by accident. Wow. Because this was not in the documentary, Quiet on the Set. And I had never seen this come up before in any other documentary or on YouTube. Mm. I happened to find this because someone uploaded a partial tape of the Amanda show. Mm. And I was just kind of, I had it on in the background while I was doing research on other stuff. And then the final sketch came on and it is disgusting. Wow. So the final sketch is a sort of fake you know those lazy sketches that even SNL does all the time where it's two funny characters hosting some sort of show? Yeah. And this show that they're hosting, Drake and Amanda, is centered on dares. And so they take a dare from a girl on a video. You'll see. This is from the Amanda show. It's loading. Emma, you're on the dare show. I dare you to brush your teeth with your brother's big toe. 
<laughs> no way! His toes are disgusting! No kidding! My toenail has fungus on it! <laughs> I'm not gonna brush my teeth with his toe! <laughs> but I dare you! Right! Whippy? <laughs> what was that? Whippy? Wimpy, 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 uh, wimpy. I am so not wimpy. Wimpy. Oh, wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. All right, I'll do it. Give me your toe. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, it it gets worse. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Do we keep going? Oh yeah. Oh God. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's the worst thing I've ever seen anyone do. Your foot tastes like vomit. I know. <laughs> yeah, Penelope Taint was another character mm -hmm. she played. And Manu, yeah, jokes told by kids written by perverts. That was written. Yeah. Obviously, they're playing characters that was written. That's from the writer's room where Dan Schneider was such a stickler for you know he had that work ethic where they would put in 13 to 20 hours a day that's the content they're coming up with yeah and there was a lot of gags where uh kids would be eating sugar and it would like gel up in their mouth and drool it out and just like what amanda just had to do it looks like bodily fluids yeah besides the trope of the feet it, there's the something being squeezed out of a tube or, onto the kid's face yeah a lot of one of the crew members, the kid said one of the crew members called them cum shots. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it was. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's disgusting that this was allowed to go on for so long. Like that sketch we just watched, that was obviously written by a pervert. Yeah. There's no comedic value to that. No. It reminds me of that episode of Different Strokes the famous one about the pedophile mm -hmm. where he's making the kids do all these dares because he gets off on it. Yeah, exactly. That's what that was. Yeah. And then while we're on that, sadly, Drake Bell in that sketch, he was the John Doe in the case against Brian Peck, who you may remember was Pickle Boy a couple clips ago. And started out as his dialogue coach and drake said he always would end up at brian peck's house somehow mm. working on lines and that brian peck sexually assaulted him countless times yeah and it got worse and worse and worse until his girlfriend's mother noticed one day that brian peck was hammer calling drake yeah nonstop, over and over and over and over this 40 year old man calling a 14 15 year old kid. yeah so they were like, you can come to our therapist tomorrow mm -hmm. and we can get you some help. And that's when they found out that he had been being raped and molested by this guy for years. Yeah. And the saddest part, other than, you know, everything that Drake went through is that at that time, Drake's parents were getting a divorce. They were splitting up. And at that time, Drake's dad had been the manager. And so when they were breaking up, uh, the mom kind of made Drake go, you know, hey, dad. Uh, I'm going to have mom take over all the managing duties. So he signed everything over to Drake's mom and was like, I will sign everything over to you under one condition. And that is you never let Brian Peck around my son alone. And not only did she allow him to be there to be around him alone on set, she used to let Brian have sleepovers with him at his house. Mm. And that's where all the abuse was taking place. And, you know, and he was this beloved figure. Yeah. Everybody loved him on set, they say. Right. And when we were watching the documentary, um, they kind of mentioned that in the early on in the story with Drake. And I was like, there's no way I was like, this is Monday back Monday morning quarterbacking. Like, um, there's no way he told his mom that. And then even Drake admitted when he called his dad to say, you know, did you see the news? Brian Peck got arrested. Um, he said his dad said, oh, my God, thank God. 
Uh, and thank God he never got to you because he didn't realize that Drake was the John Doe in the case. Um, and when he found out, he just absolutely broke down and was like, I fucking told his mom to keep him away from him. So that is a failure of the on the mom's behalf. No, but also when the news came out that Brian Peck was arrested and obviously Drake was a minor, so it was a John Doe in the case, yeah. his dad told him, Oh, thank God he's arrested. I knew that guy was bad, and yeah. I'm so glad he never got to you. Yeah, exactly. And Drake is like, um, yeah, mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. It's like, wow. And how is Drake's dad the only one that could see this? He probably wasn't. There's too many people that are blinded by everything. And there were uh, parents that were saying to people, you know, like, these uh these jokes are getting like way too adult related and you know sexually related and um some of the managers of the actors would call the parents and be like will you shut up and just let us collect this money and make this show like don't even worry about it the kids don't even know what they're saying so it's like a wink wink thing for the adults yeah there's a mom that in the documentary one of the moms of the a background actor that was in the amanda show in this courtroom judge judy type sketch mm -hmm. she was excited to be there this girl yeah just sitting there in the set you know on set in the courtroom set and the mom said that she was friends with this older guy on the set jason handy yes and he was remind me what was he on the set he was a pa a PA, okay. Yeah. Production assistant. So that's the lowest level you could possibly okay. be on the production side. So he, I should say he befriended this girl, yeah. this minor, and then started sending her emails. Mm -hmm. And the mom thought that was a little strange. And then one of the emails suddenly contained a picture of him fully nude saying, yeah. I think you might like this. Yeah. Or I think you should see this. Yeah. She was up in the, the, you know family computer room and got up started running away crying so upset and slammed her door and her mom's like what's going on she went to the computer and there he was just completely naked sending full body naked shots during the days of dial-up internet yeah which is insane right it's it's so brazen and sending it to a child saying uh i just wanted you to see this so you for you to know how happy you make me and a guy whose last name is Handy. That's what Shannon's saying. Handy and Peck, the names alone. Oh, God. Well, there is a lot to unpeck in this story. Yeah. Because even... Get it? Nice. Okay. Even Handy <laughs> um, was sitting on... He would go to like... Uh, he was a little handsy. Yeah, very much so. He would go to like kids' houses that were fans of the show and the parents would allow them to like be in their rooms alone with the, this girl was like nine years old mm. and he's in her room alone with the door closed playing video games with her and he makes a move and makes out with her and she freaks out and oh my god i forgot about he was that. like just please don't tell anybody it'll be very upsetting and you know you'll never be able to come to see the show anymore and scared them into not telling anybody like yeah, oh the, you'll never be allowed here again the mom didn't tell yeah, the mom was the mom was so worried about what people would think that she allowed her kid to be in contact with a pedophile instead of worrying about, oh, my God, he can do this to other people. So she just went into self-protection mode and was like, I just won't allow her to go near this guy. Yeah. But then he finally was caught after and like dozens more were attacked. Yeah. And then back to Brian Peck, he was hosting a party just like handy he would befriend the kids on set which was odd yeah and one of the kids from all that came across in his bedroom a letter from john wayne gacy mm. and a signed photo yeah of him dressed as the clown like to my friend brian peck love john wayne gacy something along those lines jesus Christ. and the kid is like what is this and brian peck was proud he's like oh yeah we're pen pals oh my god what a sicko yeah and you can't say oh that's just being a horror fan or something because that is a real life serial killer mm -hmm. who killed 33 young boys yeah 
And Brian Peck, just like Danny Masterson, when he goes to trial in Van Nuys for attacking, uh, straight up attacking Drake Josh, uh, Drake, Drake Drake Bell, Jesus. Drake Bell, uh, sexually no re- abusing him for years. Yeah, and no relation to Josh Peck, by the way. It's yeah, his co-star and Drake and Josh. Yeah, uh, there are about fifty people sitting behind Brian Peck who know what he did to a child. Yeah, on his side of the courtroom, the supporters. And there was about three people supporting Drake. Mm -hmm. And he's a child and has to stand up and read uh, a letter saying, shame on everyone that's sitting on that side of the courtroom. And that fucking great job um, sticking up for yourself against all those people. Uh, I think, you know, that is one of the bravest things you could possibly do. The cowards that were also there... There were, I believe, 51 or 41 letters of support written by famous people on behalf of Brian Peck to get him a lesser sentence, just like Danny Masterson's. Mm -hmm. And this is, in my opinion, even worse, because these are children he was molesting and sexually abusing. 41 letters. Yeah, and I have some of them here. First up, James Marsden. He said he couldn't breathe when he learned of Brian Peck's arrest. That really makes me not like James Marsden, James Marsden anymore. Yeah, and that he said that he was a close friend and that Brian Peck is one of the reasons why he was successful as he was in the industry. <laughs> Quote, I've known Brian for 14 years and never once did I ever see any sign of him being capable of something like this. I have lived at his house for months and shared hotel rooms with him And never once did he ever make me feel compromised or uncomfortable in any way. And then next up, we have Taryn Killam, who I guess was on Nickelodeon shows before SNL. Wow. I didn't realize he was around that. I didn't either. And he called Brian Peck one of his dearest friends. Mm. And then we got Alan Thicke, America's dad. From Growing Pains. This one is really weird. He says that I am writing to express my estimation of Brian Peck as an honorable, respectful, intelligent human being who apparently made a gigantic mistake, which will haunt him for life. And this is after everyone knows that he's admitted to the allegations. Yeah. He's guilty. Yeah, because he was on a recorded telephone call admitting to everything to Drake. And then at the end of the at the end of the conversation, he just goes, are we being recorded? And they already had everything they they needed. Like you often say, some people want to tell on themselves. Oh, yeah. And sounds like Brian Peck was in that boat. Yeah, definitely. So Alan Thicke goes on to say, quote, I am honored to be regularly included in lists of America's favorite TV dads an identity that I proudly carry throughout the country in writing about and lecturing to families on issues of parental concern. And he goes on and on about that status as America's favorite dad. And then he applies that to Brian Peck. Like he knows good character. Oh my God. Could you imagine cashing in the, be the America's favorite dad card for this, for this of all the things, right? (laughs) <laughs> to stand up for an admitted pedophile. He's like, and you may know my son, future Blurred Lines star Robin Thicke. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. And then we get to Joanna Kearns, his wife on Growing Pains. Mm-hmm. She called Brian Peck a good man that made a mistake, not a bad man who got caught. Jesus. Unbelievable. And by the way, all the people from Boy Meets World besides Ben Savage. Oh, yeah. Kids wrote letters. Yeah. Ryder Strong and Will Friedel. Mm -hmm. And then they were asked about that for the documentary. So they had a heads up that was going to be discussed and quiet on the set. Mm -hmm. So they beat them to the punch. And on their podcast, Pod Meets World about boy meets world yeah they did a whole episode talking about brian peck before quiet on the set was released wow and absent from their discussion that day the letters they wrote in support of him yeah 
Exactly. They just had this attitude like, gee whiz, we didn't know how bad it really was. And it's crazy. There's a clip I heard of Ryder Strong explaining it like, honestly, we were young and stupid. And we just thought it was the sort of thing like, oh, Brian Peck was tempted by a hot guy. This hot kid actor came on to him. Yeah. And Brian Peck gave in. Oh, my God. If Even if you thought that was the case, Kyle, would that be okay? No. I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah. X-Men producer Tom DeSanto wrote that jail time would be detrimental to Peck's efforts to pull his life back together. <laughs> but it would be helpful in terms of stopping child abuse. Yeah. I love how they, he has ruined this kid's life and they're worried about this grown adult who is a predator. Yeah. Oh, my God. The worst one, though, is this lady from Twin Peaks. This one is absolutely bonkers. Kimmy Robertson. Mm. She said that she met Peck on her first ever acting job and they became best friends. The Last American Virgin in 1982. That was the movie. And it was a handwritten letter that she gave to the judge. Yeah. So, and then she really trashes Drake Bell in this. Quote, I noticed this young man kept asking me about Brian and generally being sleuth-like. I also noticed no gay male, i.e. makeup, hair, or PA, want to be alone in a room with him. And then she said that Drake pressured Peck and that... In a sense, he seduced Peck mm -hmm. and called him an outrageous, overtly gay, oversexed person. That's what she's talking about. She called Drake? Yeah, Drake overtly Bell. Overtly gay? She called Drake Bell a minor, quote, an outrageous, overtly gay, oversexed person. And that he totally took advantage of Brian's willingness to help anyone who needs it. What? Are we in the Twilight Zone? Yeah. Obviously, these people thought these letters would never be unearthed. Yeah. They were just unearthed recently because the producers of the documentary, documentary merely asked for it. Mm. They were sealed at the time because Drake Bell was a minor. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, these are crazier than the Danny Masterson letters. Yeah. Yeah, this is much, much, much darker. And Brian Peck was charged in 2003 with sexually abusing Drake Bell, but it was John Doe at the time. And he served, I believe, 16 months. Yeah. That's nothing. Yeah, so he's out and about. And after he got out of prison and became a registered sex offender, he got picked up by Disney, which Dan Schneider likes to point out, being like, well, Disney picked him up after. Being like, they're worse than Nickelodeon because we didn't know about it then. So yeah, because Disney's that, more evil. Right. <laughs> Stop looking at me. Yeah. They were hired by, or excuse me, he was hired by this team that also wrote letters. Am I right? Yeah. Like a writing or producing team on Sweet Life. Yeah. And in there, who is this? Can we find this out? Let me see. Because I know that they wrote in their letter to the judge, oh, I would be honored to work with Brian Peck again. Ugh. It would be my pleasure and I can't wait to do it. And so they were people of their words. And sure enough, they hired him for Sweet Life to be the voice of this magic mirror. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's it's. How does that happen? How does he get hired by Disney? And they made sure to make it a voice role. So that he wouldn't have to be around kids. Oh, my God. So they knew? Of course they did. Oh, the people shit. that hired him for Sweet Life, that's what I was saying. Yeah. They had written a, one of the letters. Oh, my God. Saying God. that they couldn't wait to work with him again. Their name just escapes me, but oh. yeah, it's sick stuff. And Brian went on to, he regularly appeared at horror conventions because of his role in Return of the Living Dead. Wow. I've seen a couple of these online. We can go through them another time, but they say, oh, and please welcome Brian Peck. And the audience claps. Mm. 
and he oh he's full of stories funny stories he said he was a pack rat and he keeps all these collect collectibles from film sets my god you know he has all these witty stories from being an actor how could he show his face in public ever again and i saw this short film from 2009 called quarantine where he plays a sex ed teacher oh my god unpack that yeah quarantine a can's queer <laughs> and then he got a role on the show anger management and there's footage on that set where charlie sheen praises his stand-in and calls him brian by name oh boy. and then you see brian peck do a little like hey good lord ham it up for the camera yeah so that's interesting that Charlie Sheen was close friends with him. Who was also accused of molesting a child on set. Yeah. Corey Haim on the set of Lucas, according yeah. to Corey Feldman. Mm -hmm. This just goes on and on. Yeah. And then Dan Schneider recently came out and defended his actions on the show. The choice of material, he said, was, you know, that's on the executives. They approved this. There were executives in New York and L.A. That's not on me. Mm. For what? The content or hiring these pedophiles? All of the above. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much everything on Brian Peck and Drake Bell. The other really fascinating part to this story is that drake bell was able to be anonymous through this whole trial mm. and that drake and josh came after brian peck went to prison and the media never knew about this it was never reported until now right quiet on the set is the first time that drake bell has not only talked about the case but came out and said that he was john doe yeah and this is unheard of think about it that somebody could bravely come forward and make their predator go to jail and then have a career after that yeah because most of the time that person would have to give up their career mm -hmm. and he still had a career and still goes out apparently and does interviews and talks like he's the fucking king of the town oh you mean brian peck yeah no i but, was making a different point mm. i'm saying that drake bell was able to have oh, a career yes that's yeah. unheard of yes no sadly brian peck having a career that's very common yeah even after going to jail. right but it less common is that drake bell was able to make sure that brian peck went to prison and remain anonymous right and then have a career after that because most of the time the victim would have to give up their career in Hollywood after this. Yeah. Yeah. For making one of the predators go to jail. Yeah. Really though. It's crazy. It is crazy. Like those writers said, yeah, those two female writers, the, uh, let me see Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan. Mm -hmm. They did have to give up their careers in the industry for speaking out about Dan Schneider at the time. Yeah. They were blacklisted and, um, it's crazy because like I said, Dan Schneider was using, a, a guild rule to say that's why you're only making half the money to these women who would split mm -hmm. salaries and then they found out that that wasn't uh allowed um you know you can't just split salaries in half for no fucking reason just to save money and take more for yourself which is what dan was doing in the, in the end so she calls the guild one of the girls calls the guild and tells them about them and um the guild opens up an investigation on Nickelodeon and their sets and their different shows. And Dan Schneider calls this girl and goes, you didn't happen to call the guild, did you? And she's like, no, it wasn't me, even though it was. And he goes, great, because if I find out that you're the person that did it, you will never work another day in your life for the entertainment industry. And um, turned out that that was actually the case. She had to give up her career in order to get away from this guy and it's just brutal yeah i mean you work so hard to get to a certain point where you're writing on a show and she just got hired by the wrong guy who is a vindictive megalomaniac mm -hmm. and took her livelihood away mm -hmm. and was proud of it yeah so and we, you say that dan was not responsible for the content 
that went on. He wasn't the. He says that. He wasn't the last line of defense. He says that. Okay, well, let's listen to this short clip. Mm -hmm. All the scripts with some very talented. I get to write all the scripts with some very talented writers, but I get to, I can put them in any horrible predicament I choose. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And I then smell a hypocrite and a liar. Yeah. So after the quiet on set comes out, Dan Schneider comes out of hiding like a fucking cockroach. <laughs> Someone turned over a log somewhere and he rolled out. <laughs> And goes to and he looks like hell. Yeah, and yet it's an, it's an improvement on how he usually looks because he grows this gross beard, but he finally covers up his quadruple chin. Yeah, he looks like Rip Torn's corpse now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see what he has to say for himself because this uh, guy Boogie Wonderland um, puts out. Who is he? <laughs> we'll we'll find out who he is. He's an actor, though, from iCarly, I believe. Yes, hired and paid for by Dan Schneider. Yeah, so he he was like a wacky guy on the set, like the Max. Yeah. Max from the Max on Saved by the Bell. Right, exactly. That kind of character. And he, well, actually, this interview explains everything perfectly. Yeah. It even goes through all the allegations. So let's see what they have to say. Yep. The past two nights it was very difficult, me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No, no. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can... The way he says... Not cool. Yeah. You'll notice throughout this interview that Boogie Boogie Wonderland is his name. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Boogie Wonderland is clearly trying to spread the message that Dan Schneider is innocent. Yeah. He's trying to help out his buddy. He's bought and paid for. Yeah. By Dan Schneider. And to, okay. to dismiss it or to sum it up as not cool. Not cool. That is such an understatement. Like you destroyed the careers of these women that had once had promising outlooks on Hollywood. Yeah. And they left just completely devastated. Yeah. Not cool. You ruined the lives of many people. Not cool, man. Right to the chase. Let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room ever. Period. The end. No excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writers' rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and, and I can tell you why it, it, it hurts it, really it, it, bad it, 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 for me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that the, and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should. I was just going to say that exactly. Mm -hmm. Way to pay it forward, big guy. Yeah, exactly. Lucky that you had it so good 
right off the bat. Great for you. Yeah. So glad that you made so many other people miserable and made Amanda Bynes massage you. That explanation of the massages. Yeah. Come on. It's ridiculous. And the fact that he had people in his writer's room who are living like day to day, not even week to week, and they had to have roommates. If you're on writing for a TV show that's that successful, nobody working on it should have to <laughs> bunk up together. Yeah, bunk up or worry, you know, where their next meal is going to come from. Well, he's clearly taking all the meals. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he would count his gold coin collection in front of his struggling writers, too, just to rub it in like this is what I got and you don't. And he would make them wheel him around on chairs from room to room so he could stay on his laptop working yeah could have and i wish i could go back and fix that um in the writer's room there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and i said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um that was wrong and that that was because you know i was an inexperienced producer i was immature wouldn't happen today but um i'm just really sorry it happened yeah now, we know you've had a lot of success over two decades. Thousands of people have worked with you for you. Okay. Let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience with you. Okay. I would like to speak to those people because I hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time. You know me. You've been on my sets. Um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years, who would work with me again. But um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me. So my batting average isn't nearly high enough in that area. Including Jeanette McCurdy, who was the star of one of your shows. Yeah. She didn't show up for your Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. Mm -hmm. And she says you were awful. Yeah. No star of one of your shows should ever say that about you. Yeah. Like, do you hear the, <laughs> the Friends cast talking about... Yeah, Marta Kaufman or whoever. Do you hear Julia Louis Dreyfus talking about Larry David? No, no, this never happens. Right, exactly. And they said about Jeanette McCurdy that her mother died during the filming of that show. And Dan specifically said, uh, "Don't let her talk to a therapist about it because I don't want her put put on antidepressants and killing herself and making the network look bad." Oh, so he's worried about the network. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, company guy. This guy. Um. And the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year, I would let that pressure get to me, which a good boss should never, ever do. Because there's specific things that you were doing? Sh sure. I would um, snap at people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. I made female writers simulate having anal sex in front of the writing staff. You know, the normal things. I, yeah. <laughs> and, massage kids' feet. Yeah. I would make, yeah, kids put their feet in each other's mouths. You know, just normal. It's, a, you know, it was a crazy set. Watching that show, it made me, there were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry and let's talk about it. And, I, I wish you'd had a better time and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Now mm -mm. you've written hundreds of episodes, thousands of jokes have been told, Yeah. but currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Uh -huh. What do you think of that? <sighs> All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Okay. Um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show. Yeah, talking about a registered sex offender being a pickle boy that teases pickles and puts them through glory holes in the bathroom for Ray Romano to have dripped down his chin. Uh, you know, it's just, like, it's just a little joke, you know? Yeah, speaking it's of fine. Ray Romano, is another victim. <laughs> oh, he, uh, <laughs> he was forcing Brian Peck's pickle. Oh, boy. That sticks with you. Yeah. And Brian oh. Hearn and Giovanni Samuels, they were two black actors 
they were minors at the time working on all that. They were treated awful. Yeah. And one of them was smothered in peanut butter for a day or so. There was like fear factor and yeah. then the dogs came out. Mm-hmm. They'll actually talk about that in this interview. But yeah. yeah, what you're about to hear Dan say, he explains how he's going to cut these bits now if they make people uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah that'll solve Just, everything. Yeah. Like I would have done. 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone right. to like, the more people who like the shows, the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say with your work, mm-hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. Cut it, cut it. I mean, that's a- So <laughs> this is so obviously a puff piece for Dan. <laughs> and he's acting like he's holding his proverbial feet to the fire which i think he would like very much Ooh, it's nice and cozy yeah. um th- this is clearly him being like controlling the narrative to be like okay you know i was i wasn't on your side but now you're winning me over he's stopping short of lip reading along with this guy yeah like it's so obviously a script written by dan schneider yeah all these questions to be asked like okay good you're getting it yeah these fucking cue cards like they're on a real show yeah (laughs) and this guy that's big of you that you would cut it yeah well okay but they're all out there yeah first of all they've been out there for 25 years yeah and also they're out there because there's a bunch of youtube videos that have you know captured these moments so you can't really just cut it now that's not a good answer no the solution the the last thing i want to ever do is put any content in a show that's going to upset my audience and make them want to turn off the tv why would i ever want to do that that makes sense i want to give you an opportunity to kind of elaborate on something okay the thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what it's going on tv that in his own words, he said that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Quite literal. Where did that come from? Oh, maybe your own mouth? Yeah. Your own you big head. That type mouth. of power. Is that true? The the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny. Okay. We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so he's trying to drag them down with him. So <laughs> two coasts. Yeah. Oh, two. One plus one, huh? <laughs> one to the left, one to the right. Two approval. Coasts. Yes. And not, and by the way, approval at every stage, really. Okay. And I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sets, dialogue, jokes, everything. <laughs> now, when you oh. say approval, these obviously that's a hierarchy, not your... There's a so, hierarchy. Yeah. So he's asking the sound guy. Yeah. Hey, what do you think of the foot sucking scene? Yeah. Did we go too far? No. Okay. We have your approval. Okay. Good. <laughs> Lights up. Colleague. Yeah. These right. are people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleague. No, these are my bosses. Bosses, and then their bosses, and then their bosses. Wow. And they're approving all of this. Stuff. Okay. Okay. And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults. <laughs> If his boss, it was like the Wizard of Oz, it's just a giant foot behind a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families, everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that. That's not appropriate. Then it would have been cut out. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push oh. back a little bit sure. because the series mm-hmm. painted you in this way that you were just the guy that was doing what he wanted and mm-hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay. If And he's saying this like he has no idea that that actually happened. He was on his sets. He knows damn well that that's what was happening. Yeah, he was in control. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here. you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. Now, this next one, it kind of hit close to home. Mm-hmm. Uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed to, to my child being in the entertainment industry. It doesn't matter what age. Yeah. Seeing some of those. That is telling. Mm. Because no parent would ever say that about their kid. Oh, I want them to be in the entertainment industry. Yeah. They wouldn't say that lightly. 
Right. Especially this guy should know better. Mm-hmm. He's been on Nickelodeon. That I mean, if that's not a shill for Dan Schneider, I don't know what is. Yeah, he's the pickle boy now. Yeah. On air dares. Seen it now from where you are now in your life. What do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. So we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of Fear Factor and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give them to the network and they would say, "One, tell us the ones that were okay. Those are the ones we shot. Those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dare. Isn't that nice that Dan can learn things that went on on his sets by watching these shows? Oh, yeah. The same sets where he was in control and wrote all the material and watched it all happen. Yeah. I'm so glad that he can now just sit back and watch this nice program sum it up for him. Yeah, I'm glad I know 30 years later that they, you know, they had problems with it. And boy, this Dan Schneider guy sounds like a real asshole. <laughs> And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Period. The end. And if I had known at the time, I I would have changed it on the spot. The only thing that breaks this guy's heart is the triple whopper at Burger King. <laughs> the clogger. <laughs> now, we also saw the series highlight two former writers of yours, two women, mm-hmm. who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Now, I know that you don't divvy out salaries. Talk to me about that part. Well, you're correct. I have nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never. Bullshit! How does Boogie Wonderland know? Yeah. He knows. Right. I thought he was just an actor. Yeah, everybody knows. It's just so weird how they backtrack and make up all these lies. Dan Schneider has no idea about salaries, but somehow Boogie Wonderland knows. Yeah. He he has all the info, but Dan Schneider doesn't. Cripes. I made a writer's deal, and of all the writers I've been in a writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Yeah, but we saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. The Writers Guild has that, but they make sure that they're compensated in a way that they're not going to be struggling to find their next fucking meal. Oh, no, Dan Schneider was real nice to them. Oh, he was so good. He kicked their asses out the door and said, didn't even say good luck. Yeah. Just shut the door. Actively said bad luck. Right. Yeah. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers, and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer, and they split a salary. So these are all first-time writers. All first-time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now, in the series... They also highlighted two black actors who said he's like, got it. That explains everything. Yeah. It didn't explain anything. Absolutely nothing. That they felt overlooked. Now, I want to be clear. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can talk about my experience, how my experience was with you, what I saw prior to working with you. But again, I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that is diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back (laughs) to the very first Nickelodeon show I ever made, that's very evident, as it is in the second one. And then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel. And every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I'm very. Yeah, he was very diverse. Sometimes he would go from feet to hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of that. It's very important to me. And not only am I proud that they were in my shows, 
I'm exceptionally proud of the achievements they've had beyond my shows and they've gone on to bigger and better things. And that gives me a great sense of pride. Well, maybe not bigger than Dan Snyder, but yeah. certainly better. <laughs> Something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah, That bothered him. Not anything that Dan's done or Brian Peck's done. How they de portrayed you really and upset me personally. And did you notice he came right out with the massages? Like that was the biggest thing on Boogie's mind. Yeah. It bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there. I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you look. With that said, Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17, and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm -hmm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors, at least at the time. Sure. Um, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included Again, yeah, all these people are in charge of decisions. So it's not just me. I don't know why everyone's blaming me. There's so many other people involved here. She was giving massages to all of them too. Yeah, he doesn't. To me, as part of it. how stupid he sounds. <laughs> I think he just doesn't give a shit. It's about fooling the people who are on the edge. Like, yeah, I gave her a little advice about yeah. emancipation, but so did ten other people. Yeah, look at them. <laughs> <laughs> he runs. <laughs> he doesn't run. He falls down. Thought of me that way. <laughs> we supported her. She tried to get emancipated. It ended up not working out. She didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. There was also an incident where she had ran away from home. If yes. You would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some doesn't say who it was, because it could have very well been Brian Peck. Wow. Wow. And then I knew she was safe. Yeah. OK. Uh huh. Because the people you keep around make sure that kids are safe. Yeah. At least three or four pedophiles on your sets. Yeah. Some people may think I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. That said, let's talk about some of the things that have just been swirling forever. Okay. You were banned from your set. Never, never, never happened. They didn't say he was banned from his own set. They said they kicked him out of the writer's room and made him. And then he said, oh, well, I wanted to work on other parts of the show anyway. So that's why I wasn't I wasn't in there anymore. Uh -huh. It was uh, when he was on a show, uh, co-created uh, Amanda's show on the CW and what i like about you what i like about you and it was with a, the friends producer uh i can't think of their name right now but him and dan co-created the show and it became very apparent to every professional on set that dan was not professional at all so they were like just get the fuck out of here man <laughs> and let the professionals uh do what they do will calhoun yeah was the uh, other co-creator yeah so dan was trying to run the place like he owned it and just like he did at nickelodeon and the the real professionals were not having that and so this is what he's saying like oh i was never banned from the set i wanted to work on other things anyway right that is a false rumor what happened add it to the list of false talk rumors. to me what happened they were adult actresses at the time and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Hmm. I'm not judging that. It got tense. And what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm gonna do what most showrunners do, which is you're not on the set. There's a director there to shoot it. I'll go up to the writer's room. I'll work on the next script. But yeah because everybody was so used to me caring about every detail of every show so yeah. much for me not to be on the set 
yeah, maybe some people thought I got banned. So it was more of an assumption because this guy's usually here and now he's not. It was my choice not to be there. Yeah, okay. Boy, when I get into trouble, I need Boogie to interview me. <laughs> yeah, we all need a Boogie in our lives, I guess. <laughs> this is <laughs> That is a bro. Yeah. This, <laughs> Ride or die. <laughs> this feels like Samuel L. Jackson's character and Leonardo DiCaprio's character talking on the set of Django Unchained. Oh, boy. Like, You've always been good to me. <laughs> I don't know if it was an assumption. I don't know if somebody thought they were making me look bad by saying I got banned uh, from the set. I have no idea. Okay. All I know is I was never banned from the set. Yep. The darkest part of this series discuss child predators. Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Okay. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show. Uh, about a lifetime of therapy. And also, he's about to do the worst bit of fake crying I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, this is great. Go that we watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. A lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency. And they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree, mm -hmm. and they still did this. It's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah, and and he's stressing that all these people were here for him, absent from the courtroom that could have been on the side of Drake Bell, Mister Dan Schneider, nowhere to be found. Yeah, bravo for not actually writing one of those forty-one letters in yeah. support of Brian Peck. But excellent point. Where the hell were you on Drake's side? You gave him a call, asked how he's doing? Yeah. That's yeah. not enough, Danny boy. Yeah, what can I do for you? I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And <laughs> would you help me? My I can't write sketches about feet yeah. like you can. You're the best in the biz. Can you help me? You wordsmith of a man. And she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, of course. And I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. Notice that there are no tears. Zero tears. And I said, of course. Yeah. Oh but anyway, so he went to prison and served his time. Yeah. And he recovered very fast. Yeah. In this crying fit. <laughs> yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. And part of here's your career. The, your career. It's the darkest part of Drake Bell's life. Oh, my God. Mm. Jesus. What, did he feel left out or something? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck is going on with this guy? So I wrote her letter because she's not as good at words like me. I mean, you gave him a phone call. You couldn't even sit on his side. Nope. He wanted nothing to do with that because they would be like, oh, you're the guy that hired this person. And yet he put him right into the next sitcom. Mm hmm. The kicker that I really don't get, after he got out of prison and was, to my knowledge, a registered sex offender, he was hired on a Disney Channel show. Disney Channel? The, did I mention the Disney Channel? Uh, hired I, I, I don't understand that. Um, 
I never, you know, I don't understand. This is like Brian Callen acting like he never heard Chris D'Elia's name ever when they were best friends for years. And after Chris D'Elia got caught doing some nefarious stuff with uh, possible minors, uh, he's like, you know, I don't, we don't really know each other. I think I'm, he might have opened for me one time. They're literal best friends. And Dan Schneider is doing the same shit. Like, I didn't know these fucking people. <laughs> and also the virtue signaling. Like, he <laughs> he's using this as his one opportunity to look like a nice guy yeah because he he's probably thinking oh my god thank god i didn't write one of those letters because <laughs> now he's using this as his big like look at me like i'm a good person and then he pretends to say oh and the nerve of those people yeah i want to know the nine who didn't write them but still showed up to support they're the real fucking cowards right at least the other people had the balls to put it in writing <laughs> yeah I appreciate you sharing it, man. Are you okay? You want to take a minute? Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Take a break. I think we really unpacked some important things. We set the record. That take. Hey, you want to take a minute? That was probably done 20 minutes later. Yeah. Multiple <laughs> takes. You okay? You want to take a minute? I'm good. I'm good. Let's, let's continue. Let me just wipe my dry tears. Yeah. Straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that if you could go back and navigate the, the journey differently, what would that look like? Um, yeah, there's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that yeah. they really wanted to be on television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it going to mean if you're famous? What's that going to mean on social media? What's it going to mean within your family? Yeah. Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't want to be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. There is there's so much wrong with what he's saying. Yeah. Because first of all, I thought kids couldn't really consent to those type of things. Right. So how can you honestly find definitive proof that the kid wants to be there what if they say they want to be there but then they change their mind later and mind you that's something he's never been accused of is having kids on the set that uh originally didn't want to be there the reason they didn't want to be there is because of you so it's not like they didn't want to be a part of a hollywood production because of you know the effects of social media it's literally because there was a fucking because on set you made them brush their teeth with toes yeah exactly that's why they didn't want to be there right but also in a way he's blaming all these kids like ugh, like some of those kids i made stars weren't even grateful so i'd like to weed them out and find kids that actually want to be stars in my productions yeah it is ridiculous we should have a therapist that knows the kids don't want to be there we should have a therapist for the kids that have to deal with me. Yeah, exactly. That's literally what it is. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people and everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. The hurt in their eyes. How about the hurt in their toes? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> That's all. That's it. Um, <laughs> 
look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I, I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Uh, that's what I do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. Oh my God. Wow. What a thoughtful, poignant interview. And that he says, all I ever wanted to do was make kids laugh. <laughs> I also find it odd for a grown man to devote his entire career to kids shows. Yeah. There's something up. A man that doesn't have any kids. Yeah, exactly. He has a dog and he has a food blogger wife named Lisa, who he inserts subliminally into episodes to promote her brand. Oh, my God. Which is fine. That's not the worst thing he's ever done. Right. But yeah, I mean, I get it. I know that there's some people that say he was frustrated with having to only be in the kids market. And that's why he had so many adult jokes in it by the end. Yeah. But still. Oh, my God. Uh, Jeanette McCurdy's mom apparently knew what was going on with Dan and still forced her to act. She also took every shower with her daughter together until she was 17. Oh, my God. That's what Shannon said. That's a little crazy. That's why the name of her book is I'm Glad My Mom is Dead. Oof. Wow. Yeah. She wow. did not appear in the documentary, but clearly hates Dan Schneider. Wow. And Dan Schneider told TMZ that he is not a foot fetishist. Yeah, okay. Quote, the comedy was totally innocent. Going on to say the foot fetish claims were ridiculous and chalked it up to kids finding feet funny and goofy, insisting he never attempted to sexualize his stars. Okay. Even though there's clips of a young Ariana Grande trying to squeeze water out of a potato. Yeah. And throwing a water bottle all over her shirt. Yeah. Sucking her own toes. Among other things. Yeah. Yeah. And sh yeah, she's holding the potato like you would hold something and screaming, where's the juice? Get the juice out. Mm. And then gaslighting everybody, telling all the writers like, okay, we know Amanda Bynes character is named, what is it, Taint? Yeah, Penelope Taint. Penelope Taint. He means it like tainted love. Yeah. Not the other Taint. And the writers are like, okay. Yeah. It's like, how stupid do you think we are? Right. Pretty stupid, I think he thought. Wow. Yeah. I have one more thing to add to right. this segment. All right. Are you ready for this? Da -na -na. I unearth another predator from Nickelodeon. Oh. One that has not been talked about very much lately. Oh. In any of the documentaries or YouTube shows I've seen. Okay. And that is a man named Justin Smith mm. from a show called To Catch oh, a Predator. What? <laughs> yeah. Wait till you see this guy. Oh, man. In case you didn't think there were enough pedophiles on Nickelodeon productions. <laughs> Back at the house, our female decoy is about to say hello to 27-year-old Justin Smith, a video post-production editor who does freelance work for Nickelodeon, the cable network geared towards kids. Using the screen name Resident Smith, he chats online to a decoy who tells Smith she's a 13-year-old girl. He's not very incognito, is he? His name is Justin Smith, and his name is Resident Smith. Not trying to hide. After the decoy sends a picture, Smith writes, It's definitely bad. I think you're this cute. Laugh out loud. The girl asks, How come? He writes back, Because I'm 27. He sends her several naked pictures of himself. But the next day, Smith seems to express regrets. It can be dangerous, he writes. The girl asks, How come? Smith replies, Because it's illegal. Over the course of 10 days, Smith sends... Oh, so he's looking out for her. Yeah, it's illegal. He's looking out for himself. ...her links to 40 pornographic videos showing everything from oral sex to sex among multiple partners. He tells her when he comes over, he wants to perform oral sex on her. And now, here he is. 
Oh my God. These guys were so full of themselves and disturbed. Yeah. That first of all, that they thought anyone would find that appealing, much less a minor. And to barely stop and think that it, yes, it is a minor. Right. Walking into the house. Hey, come on in. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Awesome. Good. And by the way, he has orange hair. Oh my God. In case you forget that he works for Nickelodeon. Yeah, Nickelodeon hair. <laughs> I mean, he looks like he's right off at the set of Double Dare. Oh my God. There's some drinks. Oh. And we have a hot tub. Awesome. I really liked your videos, by the way. Did you really? Sorry, Ben. I've been good. It took me like 21 minutes to get down here because there was so much traffic. Are you serious? Where do you live? North Hollywood. Oh, that's not bad. Hey. We had a lot to talk about. Look. <laughs> North Hollywood is not all bad. Yeah. You have a seat. You and I, why don't you just have a seat right there, please? Okay. I need to keep, no, I need to. No, seriously. I have to go. You're going to want to talk to me. I'm sorry. Trust me on this. Now, you work at Nickelodeon, huh? No. You don't. What's your name? He's like, I see the hair. You work at Nickelodeon, don't Cor you? Corporate guy, huh? Put your hands, hands back, your head, back your head, back your head. On your knees, both knees. What's that? He thought he was gonna say that. Oh God. <laughs> and he cries like a little bitch more than any other predator on the show. Yeah. Because he realizes that he just fucked up his life. Good. And he's one of the few predators that had this much to lose. <laughs> I guess. Because all the other predators are like. Uh, okay. Yeah. I guess we're going to jail now. Well, half of them. Yeah. A lot of them react badly, but this guy, it's like Niagara Falls. Oh. Stand up, guys. I swear to God. Smith is taken to the processing center where a police investigator interviews him. I'd be lucky if I have any sort of resemblance to my job, to my friends, so that my family perceives me, to, to the girlfriend I've had, the dog we have together. He knew coming. Gustav saying th that. Chris Hansen should have been on the Nickelodeon sets. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> have a seat. Everyone would be arrested. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no one would get out alive. Dan Schneider goes, I'm already seating. Yeah. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. And this guy, he's only sad because his career is over. Yeah. In, that what he was doing was wrong. That's why when he realized that he was caught and the ramifications on his life and everyone around him, that in my mind is why he became so emotional. Smith later pleaded no contest to two counts, an attempted lewd act upon a child and attempting to send harmful matter. Nickelodeon told us they fired Smith and that he had no contact with children when he worked there. Oh, my God. Well, they did the right thing. They fired him. Oh, good for them. Wow. Yeah, they deserve a medal. The idea that he's editing the programs and then trolling for kids on the Internet at the same time. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah, these people go wherever, wherever there's some sort of supply for themselves. And dyeing his hair orange for the kid. Yeah. And wearing the green shirt. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah. I mean, that's just... Not good. Right. I mean, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Yeah. Good Lord. Many things. It'd be like if he worked on a Disney set like Sweet Life and then shows up in Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like trying to make a mockery of the whole thing. Yeah. Ugh, well, thank God he went to jail. Yeah. And the Nickelodeon fired. Him. Yeah, that's very nice of them. So any other thoughts on this whole thing, Kyle? No more thoughts on this. I am glad to get away from this goddamn story for now. It, me too. It is bumming me out. Okay, let's cheer up now. Yeah, let's cheer up and go to the last story of the evening. And what would a Tuesday Night Live be without talking about Mr. Alec Baldwin? Ooh. Yeah. So uh, there's more? Yeah, the prosecutors have come out and said they're throwing some wild allegations out there that Alec Baldwin uh, anonymously leaked set footage in order to sway grand jury. 
wait, all that footage of him shooting the gun and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But that makes him look bad. <laughs> well, he thought for a second that I was going to make him look good because the director yells cut and then he shoots the gun. Yeah. Um, but there's other uh, there's other footage as well where he's just practicing the gun and you could see that he I didn't have my finger on the trigger. I would never pull the trigger. Mm. I would never do that. Mm. It's a part of my training. She was my friend. She was my friend. That was a part of my training. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Leaks. So at the end of last year, it was uh, November of 2023. Um, there was a bunch of footage sent sent out because he could feel the pressure on himself uh, starting to gain steam here. Much like the pressure of the gun he did, or did not the, fire. Definitely pulled the trigger on. Um, they say Alec Baldwin has been accused of leaking footage from the shooting of the film Rust to the media in an attempt to receive a favorable outcome on his November grand jury hearing on the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins uh, on set when the gun he was holding went off. That's interesting that a gun you're holding goes off, but uh, I did not pull the trigger. Hmm. I, I did not do that as a part of my training. Well, yeah, he claims that it just went off. Yeah. Um, let's see. But I think he's off his rocker. Yeah. If you ask me. Am I right? <laughs> this Shannon's asking that was the haha. -ha. The haha -ha was his interview because it was so fucking embarrassing. Right. The, not the entire story. No, the the Dan Schneider was attempting to be heroic in his interview. Yes, exactly. Oh, thank you, Manu. Saying uh do a great Alec impression. Manu, I can do it too. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I didn't pull the trigger. <laughs> I can do a lot of it too. <laughs> cool combo. I am from Spain. I am from Spain. Um, in the video, the actor can be heard telling crew members to move out of the path of the gun in the footage. So I believe this is different footage than what we've been seeing, which is him shooting the gun after they say cut. Mm -hmm. I think that's getting leaked to make to counteract the footage that he leaked. Ah, because in his footage, he's telling people get out of the path of the gun. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, though. In most of the footage, he looks like a maniac. Well, yeah, but also people who are that narcissistic don't realize how bad they come off because they're just like, oh, I'm on camera. I must look great. And remember on another episode where we went through that leaked phone call? Mm -hmm. He's like, I need to get the word out there that I am not a murderer. Yeah. Yeah, this does not help me. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> None of this helps you because you look bad. And let's think about Helena Hutchins and her family. Yeah. What do you think they feel like? The New Mexico special prosecutors, Carrie Morrissey and Jason Lewis, have now claimed that Baldwin may have released cherry-picked videos to NBC News to generate sympathy for the target, which is himself. Uh, the video, they allege, was released through a third party. So he got, got the, the footage into a friend's hands and said, release this. What? <laughs> nice um counsel for the state is concerned that any recordings of hearings related to the grand jury proceedings will be used to continue to taint penelope taint the grand jury process by the target and or his counsel did dan schneider write this story? Yeah. <laughs> in the video footage baldwin could be heard saying now wait a second i'm going to shoot right do you mind going to the other side of the camera i don't want to shoot toward you Another point, Baldwin appeared concerned for the safety of whoever is behind the camera saying, I don't know why you're, I don't know why you're going up the hills and all this other, you're going to, you're going to break your fucking neck. And good it's guy. Some, what's that? Good, good guy. Good guy. Yeah. yeah. And in some ways that leaked phone call makes him look good. It makes him look like an asshole, but it also shows him saying, I don't know why it was Dave that handed me the gun and. It's almost like he knows he's being recorded at some point. Yeah. And yet other times it doesn't because it makes him sound like such a narcissistic asshole. Yeah. When he's worried about not going to the Lorne Michaels tribute. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. But it's all it's all performative. That's yeah. why. It doesn't matter if it, he's being recorded or not. He wants oh. to sway whoever he's talking to. So it's always I see this act. 
And then he just doesn't realize sometimes how much of an asshole he comes off as. Right. <laughs> um, Morrissey and Lewis also alleged that the same reporter who broke the video footage story on NBC News had previously worked for CNN and interviewed Baldwin and his attorney for the channel in August 2022, giving him a platform to publicly present his defense that he did not pull the trigger when the gun went off, killing Helena Hutchins and injuring Joel Souza on October 21st, 2021. Mm. So that's interesting. Yeah. The same reporter that did a puff piece for a different channel is the person that uh, leaked it to NBC News. Wow. Interesting. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> uh, and that leads to people asking. A more important story. Very, very, very big important thing to consider here. Could he be in Beetlejuice 2? Him and Gina Davis. Gina Davis. Uh, despite being key characters in the original movie, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis likely won't appear in Beetlejuice 2. Mm. No, duh. I don't, Gina Davis could have without a problem, but um, yeah, Alec probably shouldn't be in this film. I feel bad for Gina. Yeah. She has to miss out because Alec is damaged goods. Mm. Right? Yeah. Do you think they would have been brought back? They had to have been before Rust. Yeah. I mean, they, they could have had that thing where he died and they had a funeral for him. And he did die. He was dead. Oh, that's whole right. Movie. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they could have had a thing where he died again. Yeah. <laughs> See, they yes. did have a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he was gone and he couldn't come back. <laughs> um. But Gina, come on, that's mean. I know. That was like when they left Kelly McGillis out of Top Gun Maverick. Mm. She was on the poster of Top Gun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, but they will not be returning. And we're going to take a look at this teaser for Beetlejuice 2. Yeah. But before that, I think we should remind ourselves, where did the original one end? And in this short clip, you might notice another actor that I don't think will be returning. Yeah, Mr. Jeffrey Jones uh, could not appear due to his unfortunate um, being a pedophile. So let's see this clip first. <laughs> okay. Where the original leaves off, essentially. And how about the math test? You have got to be kidding me. We spent the whole week studying for that test. I got an A. So can I? Well, I don't know. Got a C on the science test. Adam, don't tease her. You never got an A in science. You. Oh. Come on. Well, I suppose. This thing reads like stereo instructions. Oh, sounds like that you got an A in the math test. <laughs> he likes it. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so Jeffrey Jones, the dad. Yeah. Why can't he be in the sequel, Kyle? Um, because he, uh, just like Mr. Justin Smith, Resident Smith, um, <laughs> Likes little boys and girls. Oh. Girls? Yeah, maybe just boys. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Don't spread false information about the guy. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. took photos of uh, an underage boy. Mm -hmm. And they found this out through the raid on Pee Wee's house. Yeah. Pee Wee had some tasteful European. Child porn. <laughs> nudes. Yeah and physique magazines and whatnot sure and that led to them poking their their noses in jeffrey jones direction mm -hmm. and they found out he had these photos of this minor and he was taking them himself and you know this whole thing yeah and he was convicted he's a registered sex offender <laughs> Afterwards, he appeared in the film. Notice I use the word film, not movie. Yeah. Who's your caddy? Yeah, film. <laughs> film. And then he was on Deadwood. 
And he hasn't done a whole lot since then. Yeah. He took a picture with Justin Bieber. Bieber said, like, oh, look who I ran into. The prince from up. Yeah, Ferris Bueller. Wow. As if that kid hasn't been in, around enough pedophiles. Yeah, no kidding, right? I mean, Jesus. Jesus. Diddy was his mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mentor. Yeah. Jeez. I don't know what that means. But anyway, um, then obviously Jeffrey Jones is he's he's also damaged goods yeah like baldwin but in a different way right i don't know go take it over kyle Catherine o'hara uh is in the trailer so that means she will be in the movie okay so let's watch this trailer now okay oh i have it actually yeah sorry i'm I'm like here play it (laughs) yeah so Shannon says it ended with Deadwood, mm. Jeffrey Jones's run. And he was a really good actor, like a character. Oh, what are you talking about, Kyle? Stay tuned. If that's what you think. Oh, yeah. You didn't like Stay Tuned? Nah, he was a good actor, but. You didn't like Beetlejuice or Ferris Bueller? I don't like to give compliments to pedophiles. No, but. <laughs> Chinatown? Yeah, sure. It's a classic movie. Notice how I said movie, not film. <laughs> Roman Polanski made that. Yeah, good. Okay. No, I'm, you know, you have to separate the art from the artist. Sure. Yeah, I guess. You have to separate Jones from who's your caddy. Yeah. Or it's just not enjoyable. (laughs) Okay, so here's the long anticipated trailer for Beetlejuice 2. And. I hate when they play those slowed down versions of songs. Yeah. It's just so annoying. Deo. It's like playing Harry Belafonte. Mr. Tallyman, tally me banana. Daylight come and we want to go. We want to go. The juice is loose. They couldn't have found a better take of him going, the juice is loose. Yeah, I would have gone with it's showtime again. Why not? Classic. Or attention, Kmart shopper. (laughs) Manu bets it's going to suck hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you guys think? Oof. (laughs) <laughs> and I call bullshit on Lydia dressing the exact same way she did as a teenager. Yeah. When she's 60. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Who do you think the funeral is for? Mm. You think it's for Jeffrey Jones? Mm. Or is well, that Captain too, O'Hara is there? Or is that too honorable for that character considering Jeffrey Jones? I think that's way too honorable considering everything. But that's an interesting question. I don't know. We'll have to see for ourselves. Oh, I guess we will. Yeah. I'm definitely going to see it the day it opens. Well, yes, I have to see it, but I'm not expecting much. I actually am. You I think, really are. I think it's going to be good. So you liked that teaser? No, I think everything because I'm I actually like when they make uh, like cinematic versions of songs like that. You do? Yes. Deo. Like the way that Me the way that um us made um I got five on it into like a cinematic dun 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 it made it all slowed down and scary i love that but it's such a cliche at this point oh i still i fall for it every time i'm like this is fucking sick like in a horror movie they'll play the mamas and the papas all the leaves are brown the leaves are brown yeah (laughs) you're supposed to go whoa yeah well i'm a sucker for it great well then you might like this because it's gonna suck (laughs) (laughs) i did not like the juice is loose 
that had to have been his 20th take. Yeah, he's just he's exhausted. Trying to get home. Yeah. So like, all right, that's fine. Right. Did they accidentally print that take? I don't know. The juice is loose. <laughs> and that green filter. Yeah. I didn't like anything about the trailer. Wow. And Lydia would still be using the same hair dye. I mean, Lydia, uh, Catherine O'Hara. Right. Delia. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. You don't know a lot sometimes. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> what do we all know? Nothing. Nothing. And everything all at once. Um. Yeah. So I, I think it's going to be good. But I got to try to keep my expectations a little low. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle also loved The Flash. I did. I was one of the few, I guess. With Michael Keaton's return as Batman. Michael Keaton was fantastic as Batman in that movie. I saw it with you in the theater. Yep. We did have a great time. Oh, my God. We I had the liked, most fun. We had the most fun, and I liked a lot of it. Yeah. I did have trouble with the overlong battle scenes that didn't make any sense. Yeah. That multiverse nonsense. Yeah. And I love Michael Keaton, but it was a bit of a waste his return as Batman. Yeah. It wasn't as exciting as it could have been. He was like depressed in it. Yeah. He's got long hair. And then he <laughs> drops dead like they did to Yoda in um, The Last Jedi. They brought Yoda back for yeah. a depressing cameo. Right. <laughs> like, what the hell are we like? It was, wasn't it a little sad? Yeah. I mean, do you want to see Batman as this where he looks decrepit like decrepit old man, decrepit homeless man? Yeah. Or unhoused man. Well, yeah. Watch your slurs you're throwing around here. But anyway, I did like the various Superman. Wait, was it? Oh, no. Superman's the, in them. Right. At the end where they show like Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But that was the multiverse thing you're talking about. OK, fine. But <laughs> it was so boring leading up to that. I'm like, OK, now you're coming back around. Aren't yeah. <laughs> anyway. What do you all think? Yeah, let us know in the comments. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wow. So much. This was an extended cut. Oof. Uh, I mean, clearly there, something rotten has been afoot yeah. at Nickelodeon for some time. And it feels good to get it off our chest. Yeah. And Diddy's, him. Diddy's in trouble. Dan Schneider's in trouble. Oh, boy. A uh, lot of bad people being exposed this week. So, uh, yeah, it was nice to be able to come on here and talk about it with all y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my computer's frozen, so I can't see if any comments are coming in. Oh, yeah, we got. Um, let's see. Manu says. They should have just made Batman with Michael Keaton as the lead. Mm. Like a remake, I assume. Yeah. Or a reboot. Or, yeah, like a like a movie a centered, requel. centered around Batman instead of yeah. with the Flash. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Another maniac that Ezra Miller. That's the other thing. It was kind of sad because Ezra Miller sort of ruined the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He's decent in the movie. Yeah, what do you think of that? Kyle, what? What do you think of Ezra Miller in the Flash? I because you refused to say that you liked Jeffrey Jones in Beetlejuice or Ferris Bueller. I didn't appreciate his performance. Okay. Or his despicable acts off screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Gabriel says, when I was a kid, the scene where the parents get old really quick gave me nightmares. Mm. Same. Yeah. That is. I mean, Beetlejuice, can we just say, wow, yeah. <laughs> what a masterpiece, really. Yeah. It taught me my sense of humor, along with Mad Magazine, The Simpsons. Yeah. You know what didn't teach me my sense of humor? What? All that. Ooh. Or Dan Schneider's other shows. Well, that's good. I'm on the right side of history, really. <laughs> Even though I was young when some of them came out, I seriously was too old for them. Even though you did a college dissertation on the uh, acting of Jeffrey Jones. D no, but... <laughs> I didn't think all that was funny ever. You're saying you didn't think all that was all that? No. Like, as a, I think I might have been nine years old or something. Yeah. I was above it. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was lame. 
Wow. Because I was already into Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons. There was hipper comedy. Yeah, but Saturday Saturday Night Nick, Snick, the orange couch came on your screen and you were like, holy shit, nope. we're in for a night. Yes, but that was even a little earlier. Like when Are You Afraid of the Dark was at its peak when it premiered, like 91, yeah. 92. Yep. That was great. August 15th, 1992, by the way. Kyle's birthday. Yep. I'm just saying when I was like... 9, 10, 11, I was way past Dan Schneider. Wow. And his level of humor. Well, look at you. And I, I never thought Cosby was funny either. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. Really? <laughs> you were too old for the Cosby show? I No, I'm not too old. I didn't find it funny. Wow. For some reason, we did rank Ghost Dad a lot, but I can explain. <laughs> it was at the Silica Hardware mm -hmm. near my house. Yeah this hardware store that also had a VHS rental section. Just like the pump and dump. Yeah, the pump and pantry. Yeah. And one of the few <laughs> movies they had for some reason was Ghost Dad. Ah. So we would rent it. Let's rent Ghost Dad again. But it wasn't enjoyed by us very much. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I digress. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Love you. Yes. Uh, yeah, check out our episode coming out tomorrow with Ben Kissel. We are discussing the sad story of Aaron Carter. That'll be out on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to throw us a few shekels, go check out our extra content over at our patreon.com slash death and entertainment. And uh, yeah, Instagram, all, all that, all that jazz. All <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and until next week, don't go dying on us. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Now we just got to play the outro. <laughs> I'm coming. Hold on. <laughs> it's about to happen. We're professionals here. We swear to God. <laughs>